Okay, Great. I have started the recording, Jonathan, so I'm turning it over to you. Great. Uh, so I am going to uh, start the meeting. This is today is uh, Tuesday, October the 31st, uh, 2023. This is a meeting of the Elementary School Building Committee Subcommittee on uh, Sustainability. Um, and we have quite a lengthy uh, agenda today. Mark, do we have a, a bulleted one we can bring up, or I can just kind of? Read I have, it? No, I have it. Okay. I can, I can definitely share it, and I can kind of keep coming back to it as we go. So very okay. briefly. Oh, I need screen sharing. I think uh, I just, I think I just gave it to you. And you did. Well done. Okay. So super quickly, and then we should probably um, just do a quick round of introductions because I yes. think most people know most people, but mm -hmm. just in case. So, an update on the energy model. Um, review of the energy code impacts. Uh, I think Tim and Rick are going to walk us through the, the current state of the design. We're going to talk about the net zero checklist, talk a little bit about plug load management and its different uh, facets. Uh, the Danisco team is going to give us an update on the lead checklist, and then we've got public comment. So that is what we're going to do, starting with introduction. So just so quickly, Margaret Wood, Owners Project Manager with ANSWER. Kathy? I'm Kathy Shane. I'm chair of, I'm town councilor, but also chair of the full committee and a member of the subcommittee. Tim? Oops, sorry. Hi, Tim Cooper uh, with the NISCO Project Architect Manager. Uh, did we skip Jonathan? Uh, we skipped Jonathan, our fearless leader. Jonathan? I'm, I'm Jonathan Salvan. Uh, I serve on the, the General Building Committee, but I'm, I'm chair of this subcommittee. Rick? Rick Rice with Danesco Design. Donna? Hi, everyone. Donna Danesco. We have Kevin Murphy um, impersonating Tim Cooper with us. <laughs> okay, Kevin Murphy, before I forget, there he's, he's become Kevin Murphy. <laughs> Kevin, you're next. Hi, I'm Kevin Murphy from Thompson Engineering with the Electrical Engineers on the project. Okay, and then I see Ali Manchaka. Hi, yes, this is Ali Manchaka with Erlitz Studio. I'm teaming up with Thornton Tomasetti on the Sustainability Consulting. And Rebecca? I'm Rebecca Ramlow from Thornton Tomasetti. And then we've got Shelly Potter. Shelly Potter with Architen doing the Net Zero Peer Review. And I'll toss it to Jacob Rakusin, who's working with me. Oh, You're muted, muted, Jacob. <laughs> what you said, Jacob Rekusen, I'm with New Frameworks, working with Shelly in the peer review. Okay, so update uh, on um, the energy. Margaret, did you get Rupert? Oh, Rupert, did I miss you? I'm sorry, Rupert. At least somebody misses me. <laughs> I wanted to be Jacob. Can I be Jacob today? <laughs> Hi, I'm Rupert. I'm the facilities director for the schools. <laughs> Hi, Rupert. All righty. So update on the energy model team. Uh, yep. After a quick sentence, I'll hand it off to Ali. Uh, as we all know, we submitted DD after a minor uh, VE effort. We are back on budget. And part of that VE effort was due to adding a little bit of insulation and changing our glazing system to triple pane throughout the building. Um, and those changes were uh, required uh, to meet the new energy code. Uh, which is evaluates the performance of the building in two ways, once by energy by consumption and also by envelope performance. And then that is what uh, Rebecca and Ali are going to uh, explain why we had to make those changes and the whole process. Yeah. And I would say probably three ways. There's energy, there's Teddy, Teddy. and envelope. <laughs> uh, Rebecca, do you want to pull up the slides? I think you have the latest version. Sure. Thank you. Can you see those? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Perfect. Yeah. And so, um, you know, as a reminder, we're working with Net Zero Energy School. We have a target for mass save incentives of an EUI of uh, 25 kBTU per square foot per year. Uh, we're looking to jumping to four, meet the new Massachusetts stretch code, which is really what has been driving a lot of the design decisions lately. And we're also trying to maximize lead points. And so if we go straight into 
just giving an update on energy. Uh, can you can you just make it full screen? So that yeah, can... yeah. Sorry about that. Let me reshare. Yeah, it went on my other screen. Oh no worries. As you could see on the other side, we're <laughs> almost at twenty five. You know, we're like right under the twenty five. Yeah, that's way better. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, we're right under uh, the target of twenty five, which is great. Uh, from you know utilities. Uh, standpoint, um, if you can go to the next, I think we want to look at the energy ones. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay, yeah, fabulous. Um, and so we're right under the threshold of, of, of 25, which is great. Um, this is with the addition of triple pane glass. The reality is that from an EUI standpoint, Going from double to triple, the, the school has, you know, from a design standpoint, the glazing has already been so optimized that the, from an EUI standpoint, the triple pane glass uh, wasn't making that much of a difference. But as we'll talk about, there are other aspects that were making huge difference there. Um, and so this is the proposed design at DD, uh, meeting the Eversource goal. And uh, there's a number there on how much I know uh, Tim, you've been working on just starting to figure out what the PV area is going to look like. And so we're looking right now at a goal of annual generation of um, 810 megawatt hours per year. And if we go to the next, um, just in terms of cost, it's just to show that with respect to the lead baseline, there's a significant amount of uh, savings from a utility standpoint. Uh, that this project is, is seeing, and that reflects into lead points. That's how lead counts um, performance. And so we're looking at 15 leads, lead points right now, right at the edge, because Rebecca, correct me if I'm wrong, the 16th point would come if we hit 42%, right? That's correct. Yeah. So we're almost at 16, but we do not want to be overly optimistic, particularly since sometimes there's revisions to the model, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're very comfortably at 15 and really hoping that we could get to 16 as we move along. Um, if we go to the next, are there, so let's maybe, let's pause there. Are there any questions there on just the EUI and, um, you know, there aren't many, you know, nothing's too new with respect to the last time I, we talked, I think. Um, the only question I have, this is Kathy, um, yeah, hi, Kathy, is when I'm looking over at the uh, mega kilowatts or the measure, Watts, yeah. like, this is sort of for Tim, I had asked it um, in our most recent pricing, we're basing the number of solar panels we need on that number. Is that correct, Tim? So that we're we're looking to generate that amount of at least that amount of mega kilowatts so that that, we that is correct so the 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 total pv array including the canopies in the parking lot and the rooftop are just a little bit bigger than the 810 megawatts per year total production um there's still a little bit of tweaking in terms of the roofscape in terms of equipment and and fitting the pv around it and then making sure that the PV in the parking lot fits with the canopy. That's why we're a little bit oversized. And we also want a little bit of buffer always because always it's based, based on a, a typical year. And some years, as we know, are not typical. Uh, so that's a long answer to yes, this is the amount that we have priced in. I think Rupert's got a question as well. Thank you. Um, I had a question on the uh, lead slide with the purple bars. Yeah. I. On the on the label under triple pane, I don't quite understand why those numbers are this virtually the same. Oh, for big yeah. pane and triple pane. That's don't pay attention at that. We could have easily cropped the first two lines. Um, <laughs> yes. This is a standard chart that actually shows the breakdown for gas and electricity. So if there were any gas, you would see uh. a certain amount of that's for gas, a certain amount for that's for electricity, and then the total would be the sum of both. And so in this case, because this is an all electric building, then um, the sum is really just the same as a total, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I get that the total is just the electric. It's the line below that that says label. That oh, looks, the label? It looks yeah, the same that's both. a that's typo. Weird. Yeah, okay. no, you should have hidden <laughs> that. that. That's totally, I don't, yeah, I don't even no know where that 
But thank yeah, you. Uh, good catch, Rupert. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, let's take that and and we'll check if that's in, in the report as well. We'll just make sure to hide it. And then thank and you. then all of this really is not to say this is how much your energy is going to cost you because hopefully it's going to be a whole lot less. Um, right. This is just because lead doesn't base it on energy usage. They base it on dollar cost. That's right. Which in this case is the same thing because there's no gas. And so it's exactly 41.9% reduction in energy and in, and in cost. Um, Great. Yes. And so Tim, I'm glad you mentioned the just the buffer on the on the you know key uh, on the megawatt hours for the PV array. As a reminder, this model uses um as required typical, what's called typical meteorological year data, which means that over the course of you know two decades, some scientists came up with the most representative January, the most representative February, the most representative. March, et cetera, et cetera, and built an artificial weather file that is the most representative in that sense. But of course, on a very cold year, then one would expect this energy to be higher than what we're predicting. But maybe on a milder year, we will expect to see this energy go down. And so, um, and so on average, you know, we're expecting that the building will be net zero, but don't, you know, if you have a really cold winter, just don't be surprised if, you know, if you're not exactly at zero and that's totally normal. And that's how all other schools are designed. All right, we can go to the next. Uh, we'll be brief on the Teddy just in terms of, um, of, of just information. Um, the Teddy is the new path that we need to follow with a new stretch code in order to meet, um, just meet the stretch code, basically. Teddy, I think we've talked about it in, in past meetings, uh, given that, as you probably well know, this project is the first in the state to actually go through this process for real. <laughs> um, and so you've probably heard us talk about it. You see Donna just nodding and saying, yes, it has been, it's been <laughs> tough for everyone. Um, Basically, what you need to look at is there is a heating teddy threshold that we need to meet and a cooling teddy threshold that we need to meet. As a reminder, teddy is thermal energy demand. I forget if it's intensity of in or index, but kind of the same thing. It's basically how much heating does the building need? How much cooling does the building need? It's slightly different to heating energy and cooling energy. Um, but it's basically amount of heating, amount of cooling. Um, and so we need to meet those thresholds. The modeling piece has been extremely challenging because the values are very, very low. Uh, and so the state has been publishing over the last year and a half modeling guidelines that we test and we're like, you know, this is an outstanding school. We're still not meeting it. They're like, oh yeah, no, never mind. You're right. We forgot to put this stuff in the guidelines too. Now follow it and tell us if you're meeting it. So we do it again and we go back and we're like, we're at five. We're doing everything we can. And in fact, we could just beef up the insulation to be, you know, three feet and everything else. And we're still not meeting it. And they'll say, oh, yeah, no, no, never mind. Forget it. it you know, we, we forgot to put this in. And so we have managed to somewhat align ourselves with the state or have the state align itself, align itself uh, with itself. And uh, we have been able to make this project meet the, te the Teddy thresholds, which is the first school meeting these thresholds. Um, the getting to the Teddy, I don't know, uh, Rebecca, if there's another slide with notes or I can just talk about, um, no, and so let's go back. So getting to the Teddy involved, as I just briefly gave you a sense, a lot of modeling, <laughs> just figuring out how to model it right the way the state wanted us to model it. So I would say it's about 80% modeling, but there is a good 20% of design. Allie, we lost your sound. Hmm. No, no I can we can hear. We can I hear. can hear Margaret. So here, Margaret, did you lose? <laughs> we can hear it. I think Margaret's lost us. You were <laughs> I, think, I think it's, it's a, the, I think it's a <laughs> her thing. Yeah. It's, yeah. This is DOER muting me, muting me. Don't say too much. Um, so as I was saying, there's 80% of modeling and just trying to figure out how the heck we meet this, but there has been a good 20% of 
design. And so we have evaluated how to reduce the energy demand uh, on the heating side and on the cooling side for this building in order to meet the state's intent. And that has been done um, through this latest phase by, for instance, uh, cascading air from the cafe to the kitchen. Uh, and so we're re reusing some of that air. That's a good thing. So we're, we're conditioning a little bit less air on that front. Um, we have um, reviewed and incorporated insulation at the foundation, which is what was really making most of the difference. To be clear, no insulation at the slab uh, underfloor, but just at the foundation. That's really what was making um, the Teddy move most, meaning our heating energy to be reduced the most. Uh, and there was a third thing that I need to... Um, Remember, but in the meantime, uh, Jonathan, you have a uh, your hand up, so I'll. Uh... So just for for clarity, for yeah. obviously for ourselves, but also for for you know, members of the public that may be watching, this energy modeling, the energy modeling associated with the Teddy compliance, is yeah. that is a parallel process with the the kind of running energy modeling that's been happening, or or what? You know, just just for clarity. Fabulous. Great question. So the state per se to meet the stretch code, you only need to do this Teddy model, right? So if you weren't looking at net zero energy, you didn't know how much energy things are going to cost you. You weren't looking at a life cycle uh, cost analysis of how much is this HVAC option versus that one, et cetera, et cetera. You could just do this Teddy model for compliance. The challenge with this Teddy model is that without getting too much into the weeds of the famous guidelines, it is, I'll just say, not necessarily that representative of, of the actual use of the school. So for instance, there are predetermined schedules for this model. So every single school in the state will need to use the same schedule, regardless of whether Fort River might be using the gym more in the evenings that another school, right? And so that's great from a state, uh, from stretch code compliance standpoint, but the reality is that if you want to make use of the energy modeling to get useful data in a way, to know how you get to net zero and quantify that, well, you need to start entering information that is more relevant to your actual school than following the specific guidelines. And so there are two models that are effectively being run in parallel and where we're actually evaluating whether, for instance, I mean, I wasn't kidding when I said at some point we modeled three foot, you know, wide walls just to see if we could meet the Teddy. From an EUI standpoint, we were just blowing the EUI to the roof. That was a strategy that, yes, could have maybe potentially helped us meet the heating Teddy, but would have led our school to have an energy use intensity that would have precluded us from getting ever source incentives would have made achieving net zero energy so much more expensive because we would have needed much more PV array. So we have two models that go in parallel where we're keeping both in track. Does that answer the question? Yes, and, and kind of the follow up on that, the it's not the Teddy model that's being used to model our compliance with the town's bylaw. It is a, a, a modeling technique that is more industry standard or industry norm, uh, for lack of a better way to put it. Yeah. So, so Jonathan, in a way, actually, yeah. yeah. So I think in a way they're somewhat mutually exclusive yeah. and um, the state has chosen this Teddy path to measure energy, not from a consumption perspective, right? So right. it's different and, and they're doing it because they think kind of like, passive house like how much is this building going to hold the energy or your heat or your cooling thinking that if you if it holds all this heating or cooling then you don't need more but what they're but it it yeah in principle it makes sense but in actuality it makes zero sense right so just as ali was saying like we need it requires us to generate more energy to do what it is that they're asking us to do. Another way to look at it is, yeah, if we had 50 bodies in a room, it was going to 
heat up the room. So therefore you needed less, right, Allie? That's a sort of like another way of looking at it. So, so to say it differently, Teddy doesn't look at this, is, is not trying to measure the energy use. That's right. And, and I just don't want to, I, I just want to clarify that the, that we've made an effort, uh, a very, 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 very conscious effort to make sure that this building is not consuming more energy because of the Teddy compliance path. And so it could have, if we just looked at the Teddy model, we would have, we would have had no idea of how much the school was going to consume, Right. And so having those two models has allowed us to make sure that we are, we've been tracking 24.9 for, 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 for quite a bit now, uh, that we stuck to 24.9, even with, and so we had to find the strategies that would reduce our Teddy, but wouldn't increase our EUL. And so the strategies I had mentioned, now I have my notes here, was a cascading air from cafe to the kitchen. That was a really good one that allowed us to stay on track. Um, the foundation insulation and also the triple pane glass, as I mentioned. Um, and so incorporating triple pane glass, um, uh, Rebecca will talk a little bit more about that as well, but it's something that we needed for stretch code compliance. We were meeting our EUI target for our resource incentives. We were at 25. The triple pane glass is something that the stretch code kind of just pushed us over a little bit over the limit to meet these thresholds and meet the envelope requirements. So um, so Tim, you were introducing three efforts in order to meet, you know, the high performance goals. So we've already touched on energy modeling EUI. We've already touched on Teddy and, and the model. It's effectively an energy model that's just different. Um, and so Rebecca now will talk on the envelope piece, which is which is the last, the last bit. And so there's a standalone envelope performance requirement. Once you've proven the Teddy, that's not enough. You also need to do a calculation on your envelope and make sure that your minimum perform the minimum performance of performance of your envelope is met. And what's been interesting is that we've had to go back and forth. Yes, not I know, I know, Don. <laughs> we've had to go back and forth. This just kind of reflects how painful it's been to make sure that the, we're meeting the minimum envelope requirements, but we're also meeting the Teddy, right? Um, at the same time and not exceeding the EUI. So Rebecca will talk about the third leg of the effort uh, and, and where we are there. Great, thank you, Ali. Any other questions on the energy modeling before we move on? Great, okay. Okay, for the building envelope. So there are in the code and the stretch code, uh, two pathways that can be followed. There's a prescriptive path and there's a component performance alternative, which is what had been formerly known as the envelope backstop calculation. Um, the difference between these two is very little. Um, they both have to take into account thermal bridge derating, and that's at Clearfield, which is your wall, your, your vertical wall assemblies, and linear thermal bridge derating, um, and point thermal bridges as well. And so there's very little difference between the two. In fact, there's an advantage to the component performance alternative in some ways, because it's really allowing you to take into account all of your different assemblies into one big calculation. And what you end up with is a weighted U value. So you're looking at the U value of all of your different assemblies is what's called a psi value, which is the basically the equivalent um, for linear thermal bridge derating. We're looking at all of the areas that all of these assemblies, these linear thermal bridges are covering, and we're taking all of that into account and we're generating a weighted U value. And what is different in the component performance, <clears throat> excuse me, alternative for the 10th edition of the code, which we are complying with, as opposed to the ninth edition, which is what um, in the past, if you're familiar with this from the past, um, had been taken into account. One of the big differences is that in the 10th edition, this calculation is looking only at above grade vertical wall assemblies. So in the past, we have been looking at roofs, we had been looking <clears throat> at below grade vertical walls. In the 10th edition, we're only looking at the above grade vertical wall assemblies. So that means looking at your curtain wall, your spandrel, your windows, and your opaque assemblies. So in order to meet this calculation, basically there's a number, it's point, um, 
1285 that we have to either meet or be better than, and being better than means lower than that weighted U value. Um, in order to do that in a way that balances also with what will work for the Teddy, as Ali just um, outlined, there's a few changes that we've discovered have to be made. And what's really sort of driving some of these improvements is the impact of linear thermal bridging, which is something that had not been taken into account in, in previous versions of the code. So this is sort of a new element that has to be taken into account. And so there's a number of different strategies. We have to be looking at many different things. Um, so the first is uh, targeting a curtain wall overall assembly performance, U value of 0.24. Um, another one is targeting the fixed window overall assembly performance with a U value of 0.19. And these are overall assembly U values, not just center of glass. So taking into account the frame and the glazing performance. Uh, targeting an operable window overall um, assembly performance value, a U value of 0.3. So some of the other numbers I just outlined, these are triple pane 0.3 is sort of right on the line between what has to be double pane or triple pane. So there's some, some flexibility and Danisco has been exploring sort of all the options that they have in, in terms of products that are available. Um, limiting the spandrel. And then in terms of the opaque wall assemblies, adding one inch of closed cell spray foam insulation inside the metal studs, going from two inches to three inches, and adding one inch of continuous insulation outboard of the metal studs, going from three inches to four inches. In addition to all of these changes, um, improving linear thermal bridge details is an ongoing process. Um, and, and the last element just has to do with um, for rain screen systems in particular, meeting a certain criteria for, for fasteners that has um, thermal brakes embedded in it. So any questions that we can answer on the envelope compliance? Oh, Kathy's got a question. I, I, I think it's, it's more a confirmation. I, I think, Tim, when you went through what had gone up when we were talking about the costs, the most recent cost estimates, all of this is in the cost estimate, the the plus one inch, the, the different pieces. So that was one of where we had to offset some increases that were for the code. That it's, is correct. These changes are reflected in the DD estimate. Okay. Um, Thank you. I just want to confirm that. And, and you know, my uh, an, a general reaction, and then I see Shelly's got her hand up, is that um, I won't call the our elementary school a guinea pig, but all the other schools, <laughs> all the other schools are going to have to go through this. I mean, we have the net zero, but this is, you know, we, we've got some other building projects, public building projects. Um, yes. This is that correct? I mean, this is just the basic code that the last couple of things have been on. Correct. Okay. Uh, that That's it. Shelly, you go on. Yeah, just a question about um, looking at the commissioning report and, and questioning using closed cell spray foam. And did you look at using something with less than body carbon? Is that a possibility? Not a possibility? Has it been thought about? I just Just curious. Um, I, I, I will answer in that we have looked at other, um, insulation that we could put in the space between the studs. Uh, they do not perform as well as closed cell, but, uh, fiberglass, any other things, uh, rock wool, they all have maybe not as high, but they all have a high embodied carbon. Uh, so the trade-off would be, um, minimal for lack of a better word, um, and the performance would not be there. Um, and spray foam insulation also helps a little bit with air infiltration, which some of the other materials don't. Uh, so we feel it's a good material. Buildability is also an important thing with the bats forcing them behind things. It's a little more forgiving to achieve your required thicknesses in full coverage with a spray foam than trying to stuff a bat between studs up behind a beam. Thank you. Uh, 
I think we could probably move on. Okay, so we just included this slide to kind of give you a sense of what the calculation is, is taking into account. So every different opaque assembly, every different kind of glazing um, with a different a unique U value is taken into account and quantified every different kind of linear thermal bridge. And then that also then in turn is, is captured into NISCO's details. So in summary, we feel as a team that we're on track for compliance and, you know, we're happy to have, you know, been getting through this hurdle of trying to align the modeling efforts and the envelope efforts with the, the constructability of the building in a way that I think as a team, we, we feel is a good path forward. Um, I guess, you know, that aside, we, we feel pretty optimistic, so we can open it up to any, any further questions or we can move on to the lead update. Shall we? Just a quick follow-up. That last graphic would be super helpful for us to, and any other graphics that you have so that we're seeing what you're looking at. Um, and that might streamline our process a little bit better. So if you'd be willing to share the envelope image and any other sort of images that you have of zoning and the energy model, et cetera, would be super helpful. Uh, we will share all of the materials. That is one page of many that both uh, Tom Seti and Dennis Co have done to do these takeoffs. So we we can put those in the packet for the the meeting. Great. I think Tim, you can move get to the lead. Great. <clears throat> okay. Great. So for lead, uh, again, also feeling like we're um, very much on, and lead feels so easy now <laughs> compared to all the other efforts, but very much feeling like we're on track at 65 points that we're considering, yes, you know, very certain that, that we're on track to achieve those. So solidly within gold, we always want to be five or six points over the threshold. So for gold, the threshold is 60. So we really have some good wiggle room here and are very confident going into CDs that you know, achieving a LEED Gold certification will be well within reach. Great. And we've uh, we've shared this slide before, but just a reminder of what some of the LEED targets are. And again, well on track to um, anticipate achieving the 2% reimbursement for exceeding the energy code by 20%, um, and then also targeting a minimum of three points within the seven points available in in these three credits that are particularly focused on indoor air quality. Yeah. And then in next next steps, it's really just, you know, moving ahead, making sure that all of our pieces are coordinated. If there's any sort of minor tweaks that end up coming up in the final coordination between the envelope and the energy modeling, and then just continuing to document for lead, but Again, feeling like we're well on our way to to making this happen. So this is all we have for slides, and I'm happy to hand this back over to Tim or open it up to questions. Well, let's see if folks have any questions as we kind of sum up. I have one more slide that illustrates where the PV and geothermal are on the site. And maybe we can just wrap up this yeah. section with that to That's put good. it into context of the building. If you can see that. Yep. So the site plan, as we have seen it, uh, this does not reflect yet the most recent tweaks in terms of uh, the playground size reduction, but other than that, it is up to date. And what this shows, which has not been clearly illustrated before, mm -hmm. is one, uh, the location of the geothermal well field, uh, which will be south of the building. And once the building is complete, basically invisible to the user. Um, uh, but this is what allows a more efficient mechanical system and allows the energy consumption to go down. Um, and then this dashed line over the southern end of the parking lot and the dashed line on the roof shows the extent of all of the PV. On the roof, it is broken up to move around mechanical equipment, largely in this area. Here, we have a low roof that is shaded by the building to the south, so we don't have PV there. 
Um, here we have uh, some other equipment and the uh, ERUs for the classroom wing are here. Uh, we are also uh, in the process of coordinating all this with access to roof drains and things like that, which Rupert would be very upset if we didn't do that for him. And so the sum of all of this enclosed area gives us that 810 megawatt hours per year plus buffer. Um, the other line I want to illustrate and point out, this red line is roughly the phasing line uh, south of that line. Once the fence goes up for the early site package and construction of the school, uh, the school will operate north of that line. So we purposely have all of the PV south of that line so they can be constructed in phase one. And so when the day the school opens, uh, it will be net zero because the PV will be operational. Um, and then once once this fence comes down and the demolition of the existing school and the rest of the site is commencing in the fall of 26, all of the mechanical systems, everything that is required to make the building that's zero will already be online. Um, and then I just wanted to show one example. Um, we've shown multiple PV options before. This is essentially the density for that part of the parking lot. It covers the drive aisles and the parking spots. This is actually in East Hampton at the River Valley Co-op. It's another project that our solar consultant has done. Um, but I just wanted to you know, make sure that everyone under, understands the, the density of the PV that is gonna be in the parking lot. So that plus the roof will give you the energy that you need to reach net zero. Kathy? Um, I have a, a future, uh, the day, I like the phrase, the day the school opens, it will be net zero because the PV will be operable. Do you, I know we're a ways from that, but the the linking it up, make sure Eversource is, is linking it into the grid so that we get um, full credit for what we're generating since we're not just doing it um internally mm -hmm. um that happens during your you're working on that with the town and with the energy consultants to have it be a go on day one it, it, i'm trying to ask it as a question because i know it's been an issue they didn't for my house it didn't take very long to get it linked up but we're one little house <laughs> Yep. Yeah. um the answer is yes we are working on the interconnection so that it is um, you know, in line with everything else, active and operating as intended on day one. Uh, Kevin, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, but the short answer is yes. Yeah, just real quickly, with what the goal would be is, you know, that the service and the PV is up and running June 1, June 15th, and it gives us a couple of months to go through the process that you described you go through in your house, which I did the same with my house too, that it does take a little extra time, a little extra time. And we're hoping that in the schedule that will be the summer to cover that, you know, if um, ever source needs a little extra time on, um, you know, getting that paperwork together. So we would use the goal of June 1, June 15th to have the PV and the, and the building electric service, you know, fully functional. And you'll be using, I mean, we use, we used a group Again, it's um, a few others on this line probably use the same group that had worked a lot on this, but they Eversource came out and said, "You've done everything right, but you've got to do one more thing um, <laughs> on a meter." On a meter, um, and it was a, a pretty easy fix, but they had to get their electrician back out to do whatever the one more thing was. So you'll be working with someone who is worked either locally or worked with these installations uh, again that's a question because i know you don't know who the contractor is yet on this we do not know who the contractor is but we do have solar design on board consultants who have done this before and and okay the intent is to have all of that lined up before we're in the position of needing to do something and the, the solar on this project will be bid with a general contract 
Okay. And and that contract will bind them to make sure that every last little thing is done. Um, <laughs> and it's tied to that construction schedule that'll be in the bidding documents. Okay. Thank you. Is that it? For that is that is yeah okay. that is the last slide I have for that section. So Margaret, I think the next thing we're moving on to is to the net zero checklist, or yeah, and okay. you know again just to sort of for context, um, the the town uh, has a bylaw which requires net zero peer review. And over the course of a couple of meetings and a lot of discussion, um, we uh, ended up proposing that um, Architon, which is Shelley's firm, provide the net zero peer review and also create as part of this process, a checklist so that the peer review is tied to a checklist. So um, the checklist um, is not, is, is I think a, a good strategy for this. The checklist is in the fold, in the packet for this meeting, but um, I'm gonna turn it over to Shelley first to walk through her development of the checklist and then she'll talk about the, the peer review of the design development documents. Shelley, do you want me to open the checklist on the screen or are you able to do that? I, I should be able to do it. And okay. before I do that, I'm just going to kind of give you logic behind how we've developed it. And Jacob, feel free to kind of jump in here as well. So the the town's bylaw with the net zero peer review is basically saying that in our opinion, um, the contract documents are consistent with a building that is going to be net zero energy capable. And I just want to read to you what that means well, how that's defined in the bylaw so everyone understands what we're aiming for here so energy zero energy capable means a project designed based on the energy budget in compliance with the zero energy requirements incorporating one high highly efficient standards to minimize the project's need for energy and then two incorporating renewable energy systems with enough capacity to supply the energy needed so Jacob and I, our first question was, all right, what, what is highly efficient standards? Is that, how is that defined? And the conclusion we came to is the thing that's actionable is to use the Massachusetts stretch code, because that is what's in effect. So basically all of the efficiency standards that we've pulled into the checklist are Massachusetts stretch code standards. So that's the part one, and you'll see that in a minute. The, for the renewable energy standards, um, the stretch code does reference ASHRAE 90.1, Appendix G, for modeling. And then also we pulled in ASHRAE 209 that also has some other modeling um, uh, suggestions, best practices as well into the modeling part of uh, reviewing the model. So basically when you talk about the energy budget from you know what we're trying to confirm is that yes, this project is is set up to achieve net zero energy. Now, I can't guarantee that. The design team can't guarantee that. Nobody can guarantee that. We can only say that if the, op if the building is operated in conjunction with the inputs into the energy model, then it should in, it should in effect meet, meet that energy budget, right? And so I think that's the piece that we want to keep coming back to in this next phase of what does that mean for the interaction between this energy model and the operation of the building and start thinking about that now rather than later. So that'll be a recurring theme as I come through that. Okay, so that's it. Jacob, did you have any other thing you wanted to say just about the checklist and the thinking behind it, what went into it? I'm gonna take that as a no, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I just we were talking. I just lost audio and video for like probably the moment <laughs> you, you did. called my attention. Of course you did. I just asked if you had anything else to add to that uh, breakdown of what. No, uh, very well explained. Work. Yeah. Okay. All right. I am going to share screen now. Okay. So um, the first thing I want to say is that 
because we're developing this checklist and again, like we're trying to make this actionable, make it in um, to be in compliance with both the net zero energy code and other things that are in effect in Amherst. Um, it, it is, it has, it has been interesting. It's been, it's been super uh, fun in some ways to, to figure it out. Uh, but it also is a, is a work in action. So we've got it to a certain point and then we started the review. And as we're reviewing, we are making updates to the actual checklist in real time as we interact with the drawings, with, with the specifications and everything else to make sure that it's making sense and that it'll also make sense for future projects. So on the front page, it's pretty simple. You know, you just inputs for uh, various project uh, required project square footage, et cetera, uh, the performance compliance for energy, and then who are the players? And you see there's things that we need to still fill in. And then for the phase that we're reviewing, what did we review? Um, and that way we kind of are all on the same page moving forward. So I'm sorry about that. Okay. Um, let me actually go into full screen. So one thing that I want to say is um, we get into this, this is actually a Google sheet so that everyone can act, you know, the design team members and both Jacob and I and reviewers can access this at the same time. So the PDF is cut off in weird places, um, but that's uh, again, like not indicative of where everyone will actually be interacting with this, with this particular um, spreadsheet. Okay. So just an overview of, of the way it works is we've got different sections and I'm noticing up here already that this should say in this column that this is the energy target section. Um, this next phase, this is what phase are we looking at it? And we decided rather than having different checklists for different phases, that it made most sense to have every phase in the same document so that it's easy to compare where, where are we trying to get where is it now? Has there been a change? And that's just a, it's gonna be a much easier way to track things as we go along. In this column, it's yes, no. This could be construed as maybe or missing information or not applicable in some cases that happens. Um, snapshot is just giving us a, it's a very quick like look at, well, where, what is the target? So you could see on ET 1.4, this is asking for what is the target at 100% SD. It's EUI 25. When you come down to 3.2, where we're saying, what's what target are you hitting? We see that it's a 24.9. So that's a quick way to see like, where's the, where are things at? How is it progressing? This next is just what were we, where did we find that information? Notes, um, we're basically what I'm using this section for is to put in, what did I find in the drawings? And very briefly, what is there, what is going on so that it's easier to again, reference it later as well as any concerns, suggestions, actions, or questions back to the design team, the date that it was reviewed. And then in this last column, a space for a response back from the design team. And if no response is needed, then we put in our, we don't, we don't need a response. We're just noting things for ourselves. So that's the basic outline of, of what this looks like. Um, and again, so this first section is setting targets. It's setting what is the compliance path for for energy, what is the what modeling strategies are being used, all those sorts of things that, and of course it's not letting me advance. So hold on. <laughs> I'm gonna have to stop share and come back in. Sorry about that. As you advance, I'll just say that I'm a big fan of ASHRAE 209. So I'm very excited to see that you picked up from there. Awesome. Thank you so much. And actually, you know, Thank I want to also say that it would be great to get the design team's feedback on this as well, because it is, again, it is a work in progress. I don't know why this keeps coming up and not what I'm trying to get. Okay. Apologize. Kelly, I have it open too. If you want me to share it and you can sort of tell me where to where to point to. I think oh, we're gonna yeah. be okay now. Yeah. I'm okay. just not gonna go into full screen because it, it just gets glitchy when I yeah, obviously when so. I do that. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> here we are. Um so basically this is setting again the the, the energy targets and, and whatnot, and then how the energy model is complying. And again, we're pulling things from 
from Asher A and, um, and both sections that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so a lot of this is really checking the energy modeling. Then the siding or, and you can see too that there's different phases that we're checking these things consistently and to make sure that there's, if there's been an update, we've, we're tracking it. Um, the next section, siding orientation and massing. Let me also say that um, we did the SD and DD reviews at the same time. And the reason is because, you know, we were past the SD review date by the time everything got into place and where you had the checklist. So just for the sake of going through the process at SD to see what would we have been looking at, we went ahead and did that very quickly and we didn't have the OPR. So that, you know, we just used what we had just to get a sense for checking the checklist in essence and, and then making sure that we knew where the project was starting from. So the next section, siding orientation and massing, that's really something that occurs more in the SD phase. So you don't see a lot of inputs there for that particular reason. A lot of this was done. I was in meetings where we talked about these things. So, um, you know, if, if there's some backup information that can be provided, that, that would be great. Building envelope, you can see it's done sort of by sections. The first section, we're looking at air tightness, and then we get into into thermal boundaries. So first uh, moving through floor, walls, roof, getting to glazing, um, some issues of daylighting as well come up in that section. And then um, finally into doors and then finally into thermal bridging. Um, mechanical systems, again, kind of just by general issues in the first section then cooling, heating, and we're doing also conveyance system, you know, distribution systems are in here. Uh, inner, and then the ventilation system, conveyance systems for, in, for ventilation, controls. And I think I missed fans up above that. And then diagnostics, electrical, um, we're setting like, again, setting the lighting power density. So we have lighting and then we get into equipment loads, plug loads, and then, um, Penetrations also through the building envelope we're looking at in this section as well. General transfer, transformers, motors, um, et cetera. Plumbing, again, if you're looking at the equipment, you're looking at the distribution systems, you're looking at all those sorts of efficiencies. Um, and then I'm just quickly kind of going through this and then, and then we can talk bigger picture about, about what we think the key things are in the project right now. Last, renewable energy systems. Um, this section I'll say, is not what we drew from here was from the um, specialized code, even though it's not adopted in Amherst. It's like, all right, the net zero code, it would make sense, you know, as a reference point to see, all right, what is the specialized code say in regards to the requirements for, for renewable energy systems. And so we just pulled from that into this document, but that's something that the town may want to consider later, just going ahead and adopting. Of course, that would apply not just to, to government buildings, but to all building types, but um, that it's just a thought to, to think about. Okay, um, there was, at the end of the day, I know that um, Rudy's comments were like, all right, where do you actually say this E2 requirement that, that it is going to meet, um, it, that we, in our opinion, it's going to meet this whole thing. And so that actually is RE 2.1. And I'll update this language into the language that is actually in the Amherst Energy Code rather than this language is basically pulled from the specialized code. We'll pull it instead from the Amherst Code. They're in essence saying similar things. So that will be the place at the end of the day, if this last box gets checked at 90% CD, that is the check that yes, in fact, we are confirming that in our opinion, the contract documents are gonna produce a net zero um, capable building if this building is operated in conjunction with the way that um, the building budget has been set, the inputs into the energy model. Kathy. No, Jonathan's first. Yeah, <laughs> Jonathan. So uh, just to, as you're paging through there, are, you know, because this is the work in progress and the design in progress, there are some places where multiple boxes in the same category are um, kind of checked off, you know, if there's both a yes and a no, I assume that means you've seen some things that look right to you and some things that you've got right. questions or yeah. issues you think the designing team needs to go back to, or, you know, if it's a yes and an M, it means, yes, we saw some stuff and other stuff is a maybe or a missing. 
um, just to kind of to, to explain why in a process document you might you might not have just single columns checked yet. Yeah, and that's a big question, and I know Rudy brought that up as well, and his comments. And yeah, we had Jacob and I had the same discussion, like, oh, how do we deal with this? Because you don't want it. Yes, some things are there, and other things are maybe not there, or we don't know if they're there. Um, that is that is something that we'll continue to look at to see if there's a clear way to convey what's happening. Um, yeah, you know, it's. I think too, until you get to that 90% CD, that's when the check really matters. It's really a guide post, you know, leading up to that, like, are we getting there? Like, or what's not quite right there yeah. yet, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's a, you know, it is an interesting thing to continue to think about. We will continue to think about it. I think Rudy suggested, well, maybe if there's two different things, you need to separate those out into different points. We'll look at that and that may be the case. We're also trying to keep it general and not overcomplicate matters and some things may apply to one building type and not another so all of these things are they're super it's a super interesting challenge just to try and figure out um, what's going to be helpful right and that's the whole point is how is this going to be helpful to the design team and not just be another thing that isn't really helping right. at all so you know we're really cognizant of that and trying to make sure that we're providing helpful feedback and again, design team, please feel free. Please give us feedback on this and, and things that you could uh, see would be improvements as well. Sure. Yeah. We, uh, we'll definitely send uh, review this. As you know, we got this Friday. It's a very comprehensive document. And uh, having checklists are helpful because when you have them, you can uh, shape the information you provide. Uh, to make sure that those checklist questions are answered at the phase that you're in. And, you know, you, you spent a lot of time having to plow through information that was provided for other reasons to try to hammer it into a checklist that you were developing. So I appreciate the back and forth that you went through between SD, DD, a basis of design that were written for MSBA standards, but not engineering standards. Right. Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Kathy. Um, well, that my comment interacts with what Rick just said, because what I saw is that, um, and, and then your memo that we just put in, we just distributed this morning because Margaret, I didn't see it at first, but Margaret said, wait to let Denise, let everyone see it. But flagging the things that, potentially are going to change when you get to 60% and 90% that the comments may, instead of blanks, may be filled in, but also it may interact with earlier comments that now they're right. in. So you said the plug loads weren't indicated at one point. Um, and then in your memo, you talked about thermal bridges. You know, So there are some pieces that I, as you know, I'm not a builder and I've never been on a project like this before. So I don't have a really good sense, Rick and Tim and Donna, that when you're at 100% uh, CD or 90%, how much more detail do you have that lets a Shelly look at something or some of that? So I thought this was really useful in another way that um, to the extent we have another building, that comes that we're looking at. It has a way of saying you can see certain things at an early phase and then go along. So, so my my other comment is we do have the specialized code in Amherst, and we we had the stretch code, and then we voted a couple of weeks ago for what someone described as the stretchy stretch code. <laughs> I call it the extra stretch code. Excellent. Person. Okay, great. <laughs> Kathy, when does that come into force? I don't I don't know the it was it was voted with an approval so what I don't know um is like uh, uh, I forget the date Jonathan you know on when when we would say the um new construction cuz one of the concerns is we don't want to make Amherst non competitive with all the surrounding areas in terms of if commercial I mean public buildings but Northampton adopted it and a few others so I can check that Jonathan on when it actually um, starts to take place, but but I found this really helpful, and I also found the the cover memo, uh, Shelley. So you may want to turn to that because 
it turned from a lot of information to there are a few areas. And the the one in particular that the way this building is used is going to matter. Um and yep. and that the the recommendation that we think yep. now about putting together a team, um, whoever would be on that team. So my question both of you and of Donesco is to be able to monitor, we'd need zones. We'd need some, you know, where if we're hitting every target, that'd be great. But if we want to know what's being used more than we thought it was going to be used, you know, where are those zones is a question. And then the second is to what extent the kids and the teachers who won't be part of the monitoring system, but that if we we early on talked about some kind of visual um, somewhere in the building, the kids could say, oh, and I it could be as simple as how much uh, energy did our solar panels generate today? You know, something that would allow them to feel like they're in a special building. So it is the zones that the Rupert and others might might do. Um, so those those two pieces on the actual once the building is up and running, the users of the building have some sense of what they should be looking for in terms of monitoring. And I'll I'll stop. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna kind of address everything that you talked about going a bit back to the beginning and then getting to what you're just talking about. Um, with the checklist, if you know, in terms of phases, I wanna say that, you know, the drawings are in a are in in my opinion in great shape for design development, right? And so it would be like it the, the details are there, right? And what that means is that we're then able to see the commission agent is able to see all right where are the where are the places that still need to be addressed. And there you would expect at this point that of course there's still going to be things that need to be addressed. And you would expect that not everything is completely coordinated and that there are differences between what's going on in the energy model and in the drawings. That's part of this whole design process because you're trying different things in the energy model and you're trying to get the details to work, right? And those two things are talking to one another. But that is all to say that uh, you're not going to have a situation where you have a yes checkbox at, at any phase until 90%. CDs. So I want to make it clear that I think that things are progressing really well. Um, with the building envelope, uh, there's really like there's a few issues and they, they've already kind of, they've already been addressed today in terms of like spandrel glazing. What's the thermal value going on there? The perimeter insulation, we're definitely seeing that one as well. And then dealing with some thermal bridges. And it, it's good to see that, you know, there's a lot of work going on in that in that area. Um, mechanical systems similar. I mean, you guys, there's a lot of great decisions that have been made on this project thus far. So it's really set up well. The nutshell here is that I think the building envelope and the mechanical systems are progressing nicely, right? And so there are coordination issues and things to continue to dial in as in terms of both the design and the energy modeling. But that's not where I think um, the most important things are going to be happening from, well, I mean, they're important, but I think the key things that we want to focus on are leading to the kind of things you're talking about now, Kathy, which is um, getting into the lighting power densities. And I know I saw Thornton Tonicetti made a comment about these things need to be dialed in more still. Um, the plug loads, the equipment loads, those sorts of things, and starting to think about the operation of the building even in terms of metering and monitoring and those sorts of things and starting to dial those in. So what I'm gonna jump down to um, in electrical systems where we have the most comments. Um, and let me see if I can, this comment right here. Um, what we're suggesting is that a net zero energy management policy will wanna get developed by the school, by the, by the committee um, or whoever gets put in charge of that along with a management team. And this ties into the um, Am into the Amherst Code F2, which says that users to operate the project in, in, in accordance with the final energy budget. So the final energy budget is going to be what comes out of the energy model, right? And so the, the management policy needs to understand what the inputs were 
into that model and the team needs to understand what were the inputs and then therefore um, we need to behave in that way in order for, and operate the building in that way in order to meet this budget. Just to, to make that more concrete, um, let's say, you know, there's not, there shouldn't be a space heater under someone's desk. <laughs> and the policy needs to say, there's no space heaters under the desk and we have a team that's going to be monitoring that. And if we find it, we will confiscate it, right? That's, you, you're going to need some policies like that to make that clear. Um, I'll pause right there, Allie. Yeah, this is this is great. I love it. Uh, playing uh, devil's advocate a little bit. Let's say that the school is it will be such a fabulous place that everyone wants to use it. Right. And so the community wants to use it on weekends, like every single classroom, every yep. single weekend and every single, mm -hmm. which I think we would all consider is a good thing. Um, it's not how the model <laughs> is done. And mm -hmm the school might not meet net zero. Now, I know your focus is saying what will meeting net zero will be, right? But I think it would be interesting to, as you're developing, this is just a raw thought, right? But just to maybe, I don't know if it's phrase it or just like account for a certain level of, you, you said something, this is what triggered, you, you said something is like, we need to look at the inputs in the model and make sure that that's how the building's operated. Well, maybe... Maybe there's things that are more efficient than what it was in the, you know, the model is, is, is a wild guess, regardless of how good we are at trying to predict what we're going to do. Right. And so I think it would be, it, it would be good to incorporate in a certain way, the fact that if the school ends up being so successful, that it's being, that it's being used, that we find that it's EUI is higher because it's being used more then that that's a good thing right? That, it, yeah. you know, I don't know how to put it, but I I, yeah. I wouldn't want anyone to think that, oh, no, no, yeah. this document says we shouldn't be using it beyond the schedule. So therefore, <clears throat> let's use an older facility that can yeah. much more. Yeah, right? that's a great point. But I think that's, that's something you write in the document, right? And so right. The, 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 the document says, all right, here was the schedule <laughs> that was put into the energy model. And we just need to be aware when we're deviating from that schedule and why. And we need to know that when we do it, it is going to probably blow our energy budget. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It just means you're aware that when you do it, that you are actually going ahead. You are, you're going beyond the energy budget and you may save money later in some other way, possibly to account for that, but you're aware of it. You know, you're making a decision that is affecting the energy budget. And then you're making those decisions consciously. And there's other things beyond net zero energy that will play into that. And I agree with you entirely. I'm gonna guess that this building is gonna get used way more than what has been scheduled right now, right? And so pre-thinking that rather than getting disappointed or, or blindsided by it is a better option than just not being aware of it. But yeah, I think those are all great points. Um, Jonathan. I, I have a kind of similar but different kind of perspective too that that we want to make sure we're building in enough flexibility that yes, absolutely, we do not yeah. want any heaters under someone's desk <laughs> in this brand new building. But we also want to make sure that we're giving enough flexibility to the users. Um, and the thing that pops in my mind that's a little bit like a heater but not that hot is uh, at least until the pandemic, a common second and third grade uh, uh, activity for for uh, the kids in the in the late winter was to hatch eggs and you know we don't we don't want to say no you can't do that because we didn't have that plug load uh, established you know so there is there's kind of a balance between mm -hmm. um the, the kind of the science that says this is what we put into the model um and 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 a certain level of flexibility for the users to make sure that both they can work with the the building um and 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 ultimately teach in the building yeah, and so Jonathan, that's why we're bringing this up now because I think those sort of considerations should come up now and to the degree that they can be, be incorporated into the model. So rather than saying we're going to underestimate plug loads, right. we're going to give a certain amount of space on plug loads to make sure that mm, here are all the things I can think about that might happen in a classroom and we want those things to happen. So, you know, I think 
you know, really thinking through that now and getting owner input on what those things might be. Um, again, like it's better to know it now than to be blindsided later that, oh, we can't hatch eggs because then we don't get to be net zero energy, right? And so I, that's where it, the design team needs you guys to, to make those things clear. And, and that's why I think we need to have these plug load discussions in more depth right now and in, in equipment and all those sorts of things. Jacob. Yeah, this is great. I'm so glad we're getting to this conversation. It's exactly sort of what Shelly and I were thinking of uh, really being important where rubber meets the road because the rest of the, the basis of design is so strong towards a, a, net, a zero, um, you know, capable building. Um, I kind of think of it in like three major categories um, of when we get, you know, a year, let's say, uh, into operation, we find we're not meeting net zero. And there's a panic and an, oh, God, what do we do? What's the problem? There's like a series of different buckets of why that might be the case. One of them is that there is a mechanical issue or there's an electrical issue, there's a pump that's running continuously. There's a sensor that is triggering and sending something off kind of haywire or operating out of specification. There's a commissioning component to that, but there's also a building monitoring um, component to that. And one of the things we really want to, um, it's, I don't know how like, formally explicit it's been um sort of named in the narrative but it would definitely be coming up and it certainly is a checklist item is the um the building automation system or the dds system um it needs to not only have the capacity to do some logging and monitoring but it needs to be possible that facilities folks are going to be able to access that information review it identify where the problem is and solve it and that part's a lot trickier and some of those systems make it are like almost impossible to actually get useful information out of and some of those systems are actually really designed to be useful and so there is like a version of detail there that's going to go directly into facilities management to make sure it's not just the fact that like a pump was running indefinitely that could have been caught you know nine months prior there's another category that still loads and it's yeah is there a space heater plugged in are we incubating chicks is the kitchen did they change their menu and are end up using um certain equipment more intensively than was initially predicted there's all those like, use category things that is i think speaks very much to the point of wanting uh, sort of a policy and a team that I think the worst version of that is it's authoritarian and people are running around and unplugging things. I think the best version of that is very education forward. It's collaborative community developing around energy management and literacy amongst everyone, all the users at the school. And I think there's a really great opportunity around developing a culture on energy management. That's like, that's the, the optimum version. And I think a, a third, I'm sure there's probably like four other categories here, but the third that jumps to mind is um, the accuracy of the scheduling and like, is this building going to be used as a resilient shelter for warming and cooling? Is it, um, yeah, is everyone going to be so thrilled that they pack into it in all of the weekends? And, you know, to the degree that there's accountability, you know, financially to incentives of hitting net zero, regardless of that, then I think it's incumbent upon the owner and design team to make sure that those schedules are realistic and anticipating those those town uses. And I think a lot of this comes, there's a portion of this that's accountability around, are we going to get the incentive money if we hit those numbers? And there's a portion of this is expectation management. And if we do go over, can we identify why? And I think there's a really big difference if we if, a, if an energy budget is blown is because a pump was running and we didn't have a good commissioning process or an ongoing energy kind of review process. Is it because you know, someone plugged something in and we didn't kind of manage how it's being used or as big as the building's being used, you know, more. And those are three really different categories with three really different pathways for addressing those issues and three really different management strategies around how we would address that ideally in advance. And to Shelly's point, like we're really harping on this now because you have an opportunity right now to adjust schedules, to set expectations, to get a DDS system that's actually going to be useful, all of those things. We can still we can still do that now, but boy, is it going to be awkward if we don't have those tools available and the systems aren't in place a year later and we realize we've blown a budget and no one can figure out how and it becomes a really awkward you know, circumstance. And I'm offering that from being involved in a number of other projects where you've been in that position. And uh, boy, would we love to avoid that. Uh, at this point, because we don't have to, we can we can kind of climb up the learning curve a little bit faster, um, having had some of those prior experiences. Ali, yeah. did you have follow up comments? Yeah, so I'm curious because to me, you set those categories, and I was expecting the first one to be the climate wasn't what we use in the file, right? Ooh, that's <laughs> an even better one. Thank you. Yes, that one too. I think I think it's. Uh, I would be. How do I say this? Like, I 100% agree with you. And then I disagree with you so much at the same time in that I fear that anything that gives the sense that 
25 is what you should be hitting on year one is very misleading. And I know we are all here to quantify that and to size the PV so that that is met, right? But there is a couple of things that, that come to mind where you're saying, well, maybe the kitchen, you know, maybe the menu changed, right? How will you know? It's hard to know. There's certain obvious ones, right? And there's certain not so obvious ones. And you could just say, well, let's change the menu again, just as an exercise, right? And so then the next year you're hitting it. Turns out that the next year, the climate was totally different too, right? And so how to prevent people from going down those rabbit holes of thinking they understand or they can actually pinpoint what there's certain things that you just simply cannot unless the model will be there, but calibration is really hard. It's expensive. It's time intensive, right? And so we, unless we are calibrating to last year's weather data every year, right? we can't really take climate out of the equation. And so I think it would be, you know, super useful to just clarify that. I'm afraid that someone might just go on for like five years thinking, you know, and if it's consistent, right? So if over five years, you're at 30, then clearly, you know, clearly there's something wrong, right? But if in, in 30 already is, is so much, right? But if you're 20 the first year, it could have been just a really cold year or a really hot summer. <laughs> you know, there's so many things that go. And so I think it would be useful to just what's in your control and can you know, like what's in your control? Like you can go, you can call a commissioning agent and they'll come in and, and look at things and say, okay, so I did find this one little wire that wasn't, or the duct wasn't really doing the right thing. Right. Um, so that's great. Already calling commissioning agent was the right action, right? Will that bring you back? Well, there's so many things that come into play that you will never know. And so what I'm trying to get to is it would be very useful to just communicate that so that whoever's getting it doesn't think that 25 is what they need to aim for always and that it is somewhat their fault or something they must figure out and they can figure out, right? Uh, we are not going to be submetering every classroom. So you can't quite tell if how we model the classrooms is exactly how the classrooms are operating. That's a little bit of a wild guess. We know the schedules and we can kind of just guess the plug loads, but we won't be able to guess them as much, right? And so anyhow, let's, how, however it can be done, if we could just be made clear that that the that it's really just not that easy to figure it out but here are some really good first steps to do things i think would be very useful i'd be very worried that they just spent years and years and years just trying to pinpoint this one thing that you just can't pinpoint ellie i think this is the exact conversation that we need to be having right now and and so i appreciate that and what i would say is like i think for everyone like at a certain point you're comparing one year to the next, you're not necessarily comparing to the energy model. You're looking at, oh, in year one, the heating system was this, and at year two, it was that. Hmm, why was that? Is it because there was a different, it was a different climate year, or do we need to call a commissioning agent because we think something's going wrong, right? And so it's just knowing, like, what, to your point, to what degree can we make those levers um, useful and obvious and have the management team that knows what to look for and, and what not to bother with, right? On the kitchen one, like if if we could submeter the kitchen, then you could tell like, oh, this month it was, you know, this amount of energy and the next month it was something more. And it's like, well, you know, then you can ask the kitchen staff, did you do something different? Like, you know, did you use something more than another just to try and, and figure it out? But that's where I think this sort of management policy, if we can help inform, you know, just a strategy for how to deal with these things. And I do think that having that conversation now will help make decisions about submetering, help make decisions about the management system, you know, the, the um, operating system and all those sorts of things. And also dial in the energy model to be as realistic as possible. So again, I think this is a big discussion and we need, it's just one that we need to have. And that, that's our main point. Rupert. 
Uh, I want to thank you, Ali and Jacob and Shelley. Uh, this 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 is really like where where I get anxious is it's like you've got a budget, you didn't meet your budget, you have to fix it. What are you doing wrong? And there are so many moving parts. I mean, even even if we identify, well, your HVAC system is not meeting its budget in the shoulder months. Okay, so it's a pretty well-defined problem, but there could be 30 different reasons, some of which are happening once a week or only when the wind is from the east. I mean, who knows, right? So how do you fix that? I mean, you just, you can't, you, the whole thing seems like uh, a, a huge, I don't know, uh, like my cat got a hold of all of the dental floss in the house and made a big ball of yarn out of it. And I'm supposed to straighten it out. I just don't know how to do it. Thank you. Jacob. Yeah, um, Ali, thanks for that feedback. And I, I think we're, we're way more aligned than uh, it may have come off in my presentation. I'm definitely not advocating for um, plug level monitoring and chasing every last watt, unless that is the interest and need of the town. I mean, ultimately, I think accountability is back to the town to make sure that it's operating the way that uh, their statute says and um, are holding. There's a version of like, in terms of what problems need to get solved, I mean, that's it's definitely not our purview. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I would be, I would like to invite into the conversation if, if something goes wrong, like what's at stake and how important is it to solve what level of problems? And so certainly my, my intention in kind of breaking out those buckets was not to feel like, and every last watt has to be accounted for and someone is bad if they haven't. It's really to answer the, the ball of floss issue. Like if we again, like break apart these larger categories, that's gonna make it way easier to understand where we need to drill into if drilling in is even necessary. It may be that we have like just enough big picture information to say, to your, you know, Rupert, to your example of, yep, there's an HVAC issue here. And then let's ride it out for a year or two because the basic things are looking good. And if it like self-resolves because of weather, great. Or if it's actually not that big of a deal, great. Or if we need to drill in, then we kind of go from there and at least have the capacity built into a monitoring system to understand, is it a geothermal pump that's haywiring or is it a circulator pump inside the plumbing system? Or, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, project onto, for my mechanical like lens on this, project onto what degree of granularity is going to ultimately be useful. I mean, ultimately getting down to individual appliances will give us that amount of power, but that doesn't necessarily make our job any easier or get to a solution any faster. So I think that really my my uh, intention of breaking those apart was not to like expose all the granularity that is required, but mostly to like organize how you would go about troubleshooting this um, and Rupert make, make your management job easier. So it's not just a big ball of twine and get, have some choice and agency in deciding how far down the rabbit hole to go and how far down the rabbit hole to go is an accountability question that I think is ultimately needs to be answered by the town in terms of what are the, the requirements. If there is a financial incentive requirement around this, then that's a different level of risk than just expectation management. And I couldn't agree more that, yeah, if this is all based on annual averages of weather, there's, all is a very slim chance that any given year is going to map up to the uh, climate predictions in a model. That's like, that would be rare that it would actually be bang on there. And so um, I, I, I just want to name that part of it too. Like, is it actually a problem if we end up at 25.5 or 25.8? And is that going to be an issue? Is there something else that needs to be compensated on the potential to expand the renewable generation, if that's going to be what satisfies the town's needs, if it turns out that they're using the building more. It's really more of a of a strategy and a response structure more than a need to get to every single last little bit of information. I think if the strategy has been developed well, there will not be a need to have to drill into every single plug and make sure that you know every day's worth of energy is being reviewed because we'll set ourselves up better to understand what the problem is and whether it's actually a problem or not. I think that's the that's the bigger thrust of what I was hoping to convey there. So maybe maybe um, I I know Mass Save offers plug load analysis as as part of the design process. Um, I think that might be something we should think about and use just like an energy model, right? You know, it's not going to be exact, but it will at least allow us to have something to measure against 
once we're once once we open, right? And then the other component is the submetering and where are we putting those submeters and what's tied to those submeters so that we can track it. And you know, just like Mass Save and and everyone else will say, we're not building a school so no one can use it, right? The the goal is that is that we we embrace the school. So all of this is great, but if we can maybe do a plug load analysis, understand what the intent is based on the information we know today, who knows what technology is going to look like in five years, right? It could use more, it could use less, but but at least, and I, I you know, I respect and, and just really commend the community really wanting this energy, energy management plan. Um, but with that said, you know, understanding that education shifts, that that technology shifts, that all of these needs shift. But as long as we understand what the parameters we're starting with, and as things change, and if if energy goes up or down, we can say, aha, it's because the school day is now an hour longer. Or, gee, who had any idea that charging twenty five Chromes every night is is going to take X, right? At least we're not going to. I we nothing. It's not me. It's the community. But I can't imagine anyone's going to say you can't do these things that that are supporting the educational program. We can though with the plug loads and the submetering say what's going in, on in that kitchen, right? Is the ventilation going wacky or whatever? So um, I. I just strongly urge that we consider the plug load analysis and then let's let's be thoughtful about the submetering and what makes sense there. And that might give us a good sense of how we can analyze the usage of the building. That sounds great, Donna. Rupert. Unmute, lower hand, speak. Um, yeah, I think uh, some of the things that might be useful uh, in terms of trying to tease out responses to the reality that we experience over time is to try to differentiate between how much an energy resource is being used versus how an energy resource is being used to sort of contrast between, well, we've got, you know, 500 more people, 500 more person hours in the building every week versus, oh, we are bringing fresh air into the building uh, when it's not appropriate for energy want, uh, purposes, but maybe for comfort, right? Uh, and to find ways to, to, to distinguish between those and to tease out a path between them, I think would be useful for us. Uh, especially, I think, uh, because folks have the tendency to look for engineering solutions for human behavior problems. And, and and so we need to be able to sort of distinguish this is this is a mechanical issue. This is an en engineering problem versus this is a, a, a human issue. This is uh, can be addressed by changing human behavior uh, and not always look for the engin expensive engineering solution. Um, and it would be great to somehow incorporate that into into our thinking. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. With that, Margaret, I think we've gotten through. Um, the, the last thing I'll say, like in this section, we're talking plug loads um, and, and the management part of it, and then just equipment, you know, just getting equipment efficiencies selected for kitchen and whatnot and getting those dialed in was the other thing that we're just pointing out. And um, moving forward with, with that at this point in this next phase was something that we're just flagging as important. Jacob. Yeah, and to that end, I just want to, um, I, I think we're all on the same page on this, but just for the formality of it, I saw there was a handful of questions um, from Rudy about shouldn't some of these um, mid CD level things be DD level review things. Um, Shelly and I did an honest attempt based on our knowledge of how how details develop um, as to where we would expect to see like an error 
barrier and closure penetration detail. Like, yeah, we're not expecting 100% of those are going to be done at DD. So it didn't seem appropriate to put all of those into DD. Um, similar to some of those mechanical pieces, it just was unrealistic to expect that all those be worked at by DD. Um, so I just want to respond to that formally. And, you know, I, I, again, part of getting the feedback from the design team, we love it if it seems like there were some recommendations or where those things are phased and also a heads up, you know, looking ahead to CD that those are the specific items that we'll ultimately be looking for. And it just kind of gives a, an opportunity as we're heading into that phase to get a sense of penetration details and some of the mechanical specifications and things. So we encourage the design team to look at from both sides, give us the feedback and also just give you a heads up of, of what's coming. But I wanted to answer some of those questions yeah. around the what wasn't yet filled out and why. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, we actually ended up moving stuff that we weren't going to look at until 60% CDs into 100% DDs because it is already there. And I'm like, well, should we be doing this? Because I don't know on a future project if that's going to be the case. This is an ideal scenario of a lot of it really is already there. Um, but, you know, because it was there, we did we did move it into 100% DD. Um, but yeah, like to Jacob's point, if the design team can check those phases of when we're looking for what to see in your opinion on a typical project you know if what would be there when just because this is going to be the checklist that, that the town uses going forward so we do want it to relate to a typical project kathy i just have a, a question I, I i i think this is great and um you know we we, we are going to open up to the public but in terms of uh the 60 percent and the 90 percent um I think we're about to be at 60%. And then what I don't remember, Margaret, on the schedule is when, or Donna and Tim, when 90%. So you would be, you your team, the Jacob Shelley team, is you're done for right now. And then there's feedback and discussion. And then you look again at 60 and a look again at 90. So you're doing both because I, I think that was one of the advantages of bringing you on now. You don't want to fix it at the point we're contracting <laughs> uh, to build it. Um, so just on a, when is that? And um, so I'm just looking for dates, you know, in terms of we're, we're this week of November now. I know we're talking about going out with the first phase in March with the um, with some of the surface uh, preparation. Um, so, so there's a second or second and a half look, and when it's a question of t of timing. So Us. yeah, Tim, you I think you might have the dates. The the sixty percent is coming out as fast. 60% is uh, going to the estimators in mid-December, submitted to the MSBA in early January. And then for 90%, I don't have that at the tip of my tongue, but I believe we're in April. So, Kathy, it might make sense. You know, we issue at the 60% when we issue that to the uh, cost estimators. We typically, that's when the commissioning agents take a look at it as well. And so that would Obviously, it's totally available, which makes sense that Shelley and Jacob take a look at that as well at that point in time. And then we try, I think it's about two and a half, three weeks, the commissioning should have their comments back. It would be great to get their comments back so we can incorporate them, especially if there's any financial implications to any of the recommendations. Okay, that, that was my you answered my question. So they, there's another, there's a mid December, and then there's an April, um, and then and then we're watching something happen over at the site. Which <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, I just I just want to add, uh, it's so I think of these moments. I think there was a time when you sort of maybe 20 years ago when you like you submitted a set and like people like took a rest i mean the team it, it's it, it you're printing a set of drawings and then you're going right back to what you were doing so the the process is moving really really fast at this point in terms of the construction document content so um i to me the 60 percent is incredibly important because by the time you got to the 90 percent they're doing coordination on stuff, just making sure that all the pieces are knit together. They're not looking for more content commentary. So hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> no, we know we know that. I know Donna. <laughs> <laughs> we know that. Okay. 
So I yeah, think- and Kathy, just real quick, the site the site prep package that's going out really doesn't impact this work. Yeah, no, no, I, yeah. I did understand yeah. that. You know, that's okay. a, you know, yeah. other than yeah. Okay, that that was just my comment. It was useful. Um, to, so sixty percent is an important, and it's around the corner. So, yeah. in January, we as a committee or a subcommittee might have another discussion. Uh, yeah. Or yeah. Okay. And, and if I could add, with this checklist now at 60% with feedback back and forth, uh, you know, we can shape what's going to the cost estimator so this information can be found by Shelley and she can hopefully check off more boxes. Commissioning agent that the MSBA hired, they're reacting to what they see, period. They they don't have a, a checklist. They have some preconceived notions and that's what they measure what they see against so it's a, a little different rubric in, in dealing with that well one of the things aside from the purpose of this exercise of checklist and uh getting a, a peer review i i love the idea that we need to start thinking now about a team in town because it's also a way of rupert and others in the schools before the school is built, starting to get excited about the school, you know, when we when we start to, you know, even if it's just conceptually, you know, that there would, you know, who might want to be on it besides Rupert, you know, is there a science teacher, you know, does our, we has a sustainability coordinator in town, but anyway, it, it makes the project real before it's started to become real. And so I really thank you very much for, for putting, for writing that into this easy to read two page <laughs> yeah you're welcome yeah having champions that, that those are going to be your champions so i think yeah if we could if you could get to that sooner rather than later it would be super helpful yeah as i've said to kathy i think identifying a couple of um members of the staff at the school who will be enthusiastic leaders within the school will be really important to that process as well so that's not a problem for this group, but I think it's um, it it could it would make a big difference. It it just makes it feel more real too. You know, yeah. it's we're, we're we're no longer asking people about where the room will be, you know, but it's there's this larger piece. So, so thank you. Um, that's it, Jonathan. That I don't have any other comments. Um, yeah. So Kathy, my my our only other um thought and we can maybe this this is to, to the building committee more than the subcommittee is I think it's an additive like five thousand dollars for that plug load analysis and um we would need I think I think Thornton Tomasetti would be doing it in support with Mass Save. If if we want to do it, you know, if we if we do it much later and now, it, you know, kind of like it has diminishing um, it returns. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that 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 sounds like a valuable thing to put to the larger committee, Kathy. Yeah, I think so too. And then my my question will be those, and I can ask this later. To what extent is there um, wiggle room already in the budget, or do we need to write it specifically in? And it, as a sub, another subcontract. Donna to you know whatever we we would need to take a look at it and know whether where it's where it's going so we, we'll need some kind of proposal um to then take a look at it yes yes yeah. yes uh, but there there is wiggle room in the budget for exactly this kind of use and I would certainly strongly support this to the commit with the committee so yeah Margaret, Kevin, could, do you have anything anything to add to any of this? Kevin Murphy's been joined joined us all day, and he's been so quiet. That's so unlike him. Um, do so you, unlike do you him. Have, yeah, do you have anything to add, Kevin, or talk about sub metering, or, or or do we want to have that conversation in light of you know wanting to be able to do checks and balances and and troubleshoot if needed if if energy starts creeping? Yeah, sure. Just to just to um, quickly say how many meters we have. Right now we've got 18 submeters between measuring the whole building 
and measuring uh, different uh, different uh, loads. And we're doing it based for two things. First of all, the requirements of, for the lead for measurement and value, uh, for, uh, lead requirements for measurement of any load over 10%. And the new energy code kind of matches up to the same thing, except that it adds, um, you know, having to meter outside lighting um, and meter um, uh, the elevator. Uh, the elevator is a very, very small load, but it's listed as one of those miscellaneous extra things that we have to, to meter. So what we've got it broken down to right now is the lighting in the building. We have the elevator, the geothermal heat pump system. Uh, right now we've got four meters for HVAC and that'll be broken up between ventilation and, 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 and pumps and, and small miscellaneous loads. Um, we have three meters for the kitchen because we have three different panels. Being an all electric kitchen, we have an emergency panel for uh, for refrig refrigeration and other loads of that nature. And then we have a 40 volt panel, a two way panel for the different uh, kitchen equipment inside the, in there. Um, we, have a pan we have a meter for technology. Um, all of the MDF and all the IDF rooms for the servers and the um, technology equipment, we wire all of those circuits back to one panel and we meter that panel for technology. Um, we have one meter for all of the receptacles uh, we do that at the distribution panel that feeds all of the receptacle panels, um, outside lighting, emergency lighting. And then right now we have uh, metering for receptacle loads for each of the floors. And that's our starting point. Um, and obviously, you know, there's a, as you said, uh, Donna, there's a discussion there of, you know, what type of information the owner would like to find. Um, I really like, as it was discussed, really what this, this data will provide you, it's not so much to find out what's going on in an individual room, it's looking for trends. Uh, you know, there should be very, very little receptacle loads, preferably zero at night. But if you look at it and you see something of, that's off, you know, then you, you take the walk and then maybe you find the refrigerator in a room or something of that nature. And again, you know, same with mechanical systems. You know, you, you watch your numbers from your electrical loads and you see, you know, your, your geothermal system is running at full tilt at two, at, at, during the night. You know, then you then that gives you the, the meeting really just gives you the idea of seeing large trend issues and then being able to go and um, use it as a means to uh, find the issue and then, you know, help and, and to fix it. Rupert? On the then lower hand, okay. Um, in light of uh, the discussion we had earlier uh, this afternoon, Kevin, um, do you have an idea of how how it would work in terms of getting a handle on community use? Presumably, that would mostly be in the in the um, ground floor spaces uh, that are the larger areas to sort of tease out if the community is using the building an extra twenty hours. Can can we measure that? You know what I mean. Um, you know, we we just we've had other clients ask us about putting small meters on, like the gymnasium lighting, the gymnasium HVA system, and they and that was more toward them to be able to charge back to the use groups who were using the space. Um, I think what it really comes down to is, is again, you know, we've we we see that the building, as was discussed, is going to get used much more than anticipated. Just it's just what it is. Everybody wants to use the brand new building because it has, you know, it's fantastic, it's dynamic, it has all the spaces that people want to use. Um, I, I, I really just comes down to, you know, for, I think the first level of it is, and Donna can jump in, is just that when it comes down, putting down the hour of usage for the building is being honest that, you know, it's Friday night, Thursday night is going to be youth basketball, it's going to be on the weekends, and other groups are going to want to use it for, whatever in nature much more than um, typical than just you know being a little bit more honest with the process up front that you're going to have that and then again the metering you know will help you that you know is to look at your meeting trends on Saturdays and Sundays and you know you know you start seeing it you know over time and you probably will see it grow as more and more groups want to try to use it. Um, so Kevin is it is it cost prohibitive so the cafeteria and the gymnasium are the two and they're directly across the hall from each other so 
it's almost like the community use wing on the first floor. Um, is there a way to put a sub meter for, for that whole front portion of the building? I think that might be what Rupert was saying. Like, is there a way to, con to measure that use? And it's okay if it's more, but at least it's an explanation as to why. It would it would be difficult to put just one meter in to do that because obviously HVAC units get fed from a different panel than receptacles and lighting do. We have to break up the loads in that nature. Um, so it, it might only be lighting, right? It was lighting to the mechanical lighting or the, the you know, like you said we have you have a separate HVAC HVAC unit for the gymnasium yeah. interior. You could put a meter on that. And that would just, you know, you're not going to get all the loads being used in the space because you're not picking up the lighting and you're not picking up the um, uh, receptacle use in there. But you do get some trending of when the when the space is being used. But again, also, uh, as you know, Rupert, the BMS would do that for you also on the HVAC units. It would tell just you. Just what I was going to say. I'm the, the HVAC about... units yeah. can be tracked yeah. through the BMS on their usage, how long they were on, and if they were running at. 25% or 100%. And then obviously, on a Saturday, if they're running at 100%, you're having one hell of a good party there, you know, <laughs> in, in the space, you know, much more than you were expecting. Yeah, yeah. So between yeah, the, the two, is, I think we could tease runtime data and percentage data out of that without having to directly meter the electricity. Um, yeah. But yeah, between the two, right. but between the two, the metering and then what, what tweaks we put into what we're going to meter that information in the BMS system, you really will have a wealth of information to understand, you know, what the data trends are when, when the building's being being used. And also, you know, when it's not being used, but the systems, you know, are not running, you know, at a perfect, you know, ultimate use, you know, because, you know, sometimes you have to change the program and someone, you know, inadvertently forgets to put the program back after that usage was, was done. You know, unfortunately it's, you know, again, that human nature part of it that, um, um, as we're talking about, it's, it's hard to track. Thank you. Yeah, um, I love this conversation. This is so great. Um, I just I have a, uh, a quick question, which actually doesn't need to be answered now, and then a comment. And actually, maybe I'll start with the comments since we're just talking about the BMS system. Um, Rupert, I would strongly encourage you and anyone else on the uh, owner's side of things to be really explicit kind of now as to what you expect to get out of the BMS system and make sure that that is like put into the specs and programmed explicitly for that. Um, it's a lot harder and a lot more expensive to try to get that information out after the fact. I'm probably saying things you already know. I just want to like say it out loud really quickly. It's just so much easier if you know what you want to get out of that system to have that um, spec and programmed in in the front end. Um, yes, indeed. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that may be um, like worthy of a quick survey of you know any other stakeholders in the school that may want some information around that energy management, either educationally or or functionally. Um, and I guess the question, um, Kevin, which you don't need to answer now, but will be, I think, a question heading into CD for some of the checklist items. Um, I love hearing the submetering plans. That totally makes sense in terms of like getting some big areas to look for big patterns. Like that's a, that's great. And I'm just wondering if you've gotten so far or will be going so far to identify um, the like data logging capacity. Like, can you establish a trend over a, a year? Like, how long will you be able to log the data for? And if you're going to have a protocol around reporting, uh, is that something that you know um, Rupert will be able to pull up himself automatically? Is that going to involve a specialist? Just like the really literal, specific parts of what data in what format can be accessed by whom and when, and just having that part specified. I know that can have a direct implication on hardware and costs and all that stuff. And I'd just love to see that part mapped out early so that it's uh, uh, budgeted for and implemented for well. So, uh, good question, uh, Jacob. What we've got right now is the, is what we guess you'd call the minimum, the lead requirement of of maintaining uh, uh, having the capacity to store three years worth of KWH, which is your kilowatt hours, and your KW man uh, numbers on a fifteen minute intervals for three years. That is the requirement for lead, and that's what our you know our specification between us and um and uh, VAV for mechanical event on what how long we've been documenting certainly 
you know, again, it's a, it's a case of how big of a, 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 of a server you put in. You know, this day and age, terabytes are cheap. You know, you can do a lot more, but obviously um, that capability is there. And, um, you know, it was discussed earlier, you know, we do specify, um, we use with a system called the Eamon Demon Meters and it has a software package that comes with it. The software package is a, um, it's an app-based, web-based type thing. You know, it's got some decent charts and it does have a couple of, um, if you program it correctly, you can get a couple of charts out of it. And certainly something that could be put onto the, um, uh, the, the TV monitor out front when, when we're talking about what the building usage is at different times, um, you know. And then also, you know, we've done that. I should back up, we've done it for some clients, we've done it that way. Other clients have wanted the meters, electric meters to be tied right into the BMS. And that you know they have it as one-stop shopping of all of their uh, data trends and data information. So you know it's certainly what Rupert would like to do. And then again, you know, and when we're looking at the you know the building as an educational tool, I mean that software package. It's a little expensive. I think it's like ten thousand dollars for that software package. But again, it's a you know it can be a very helpful tool between educational use and also for um, how to manage the building. Thanks. That's great. So it is now 4.23. Um, we're scheduled to go till five. And I just want to maybe go back to Margaret's uh, agenda and make sure we haven't missed anything uh, critical because we do want to save some time for uh, public comment, not to intentionally cut off anything now. But. No, I. so I think we really... Uh, we I think we've went, touched on a lot of it, yeah. Very, we went very deeply into the, the issue the, the big issue, the plug load management issue in a very useful way. We haven't touched specifically on the kitchen equipment um, and the lighting density, although I think we've discussed the approach yep. to managing those items. So I don't know whether whether Dennis, anyone on the Dinesco team wants to say anything more about uh, the, the kitchen equipment or the lighting density as it relates to uh, energy performance, just to close the loop on that, but we don't think it's necessary either. We don't have anything additional to add to that today. Okay. I, I just have one, another question for Kevin, if I may. Go ahead. Um, uh, I like, I like in terms of, of the big HVAC stuff, the 15 minute interval sounds great to me. I wonder if you know what the current uh, time span is that the utility company uses for uh, demand fees and uh, what kind of, how that would interface uh, with, with trying to navigate uh, unexpected uh, high demand. I, d I don't know what it is out um, ever sourced out in Western Mass, but it's typically it's the 15 minute intervals. Okay. I've heard some of the small municipals having five or 10 minute, but I believe 15 minute is pretty much the standard. Cool. I 20 years ago, I think it was six minutes, but I don't know. Yeah. It's, I've been out of the field for a while. It, and, you know, again, at, we can certainly <laughs> ask the question for, um, unfortunately, Eversource um, Western Mass is the old Western Mass Electric. So they're not, Eversource is a conglomerate of four different companies they bought over time. And unfortunately, they all don't seem to use the same same um, design. Yeah, exactly. So I can certainly send an email out there to ask the question what their interval is for that. Um, but just real quick, if I could say on lighting controls, you know, we're specifying a system that we can do a lot of things with it, and certainly, um, you know, that takes you know sit down with Rupert and, and Rupert and that and principals and whatever to talk about how they want to program the system and for us to, you know get that into the the design a little bit under the drawings. And obviously there will be a huge meeting before they program it that we call for to get that other information in there. Um, one thing that we are planning on doing that hasn't really been talked about is the lighting control system has something called a high trim setting. And we're proposing to, even though our goal is, you know, we're looking at our past projects, our lighting, has been between 0.45 and 0.52 watts a square foot. The high level trim is you set the lighting to not go above 85% of its, of its total uh, usage. So there's a way to even save another 15% on your lighting 
if if one room complains, Rupert, that it's it's a little dark in there, you can raise that individual's lights up a little bit and then keep the others at the lower number. So there's a lot of things that you can do with these systems that um, you can save energy along the way in the programming that, you know, obviously is very, you know, at this point, obviously would be very hard to to put into the model, but the programs do allow a lot of flexibility to do things like that. Um, Jonathan, do you want to say anything about um, our earlier exchange about uh, the constraints of Chapter 149 bidding on, you know, some of the issues that we've got to deal with? You're muted. <laughs> well, you're never going to hear me if I keep it that way. <laughs> so I have no comments, would I? I was going to try um, and interpret that. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, one of the, one of the items in, in Rudy's, uh, uh, you know, wonderfully in-depth comments were, you know, can we can we get to some of the makes and models, essentially, of, of some of this equipment? I think particularly he was thinking around the, the kitchen equipment. Kitchen equipment, yeah. You know, where we have, you know, they use a lot of energy and they they run for a while. Um, and I think he also asked a question about, you know, trying to tease apart what's in the, the FF&E budget, what's in the um the construction budget I, I would let i would defer to tim on on that piece of it but um either way whether it's procured through the construction budget or through the ff and e budget um we will have to go through the, the the state's public bidding process for both of those things where unless something is really unique and really important um we have to list or you know there could be a basis of design but you're effectively opening it up to three or more different competitors um, for each piece of equipment, which makes it very hard to say with any definitiveness what any one piece of equipment will be um, today or even on the day you go to bid. Um, you won't know the answers to some of those sorts of questions until uh, those bids come in. Um, and so that, you know, from from a kind of design perspective, I, I'm expecting the, the group writ large are having to use a certain um, level of approximation when they're determining uh, equipments and equipment loads and and you know basing it on typicals. Um, that was kind of my my thought yeah, when I was I, reading that piece of it. Yeah, I think I think that's exactly right. But I think with that point, we could certainly open up to public comment, Jonathan, whenever you're ready. We've covered everything on the agenda. Great. Um, Kathy, I'm going to rely on you to see because I don't think yeah, I can. Yeah, so I I am um, I so I see uh, one hand and I it's Rudy and I'm going to allow Rudy to talk and I'm going to bring Bruce also has his hand up so I'm going to bring Rudy and Bruce in. Um, you're both. You should both be in. Could we start with Rudy since I think you yeah. noticed he was yeah. first? Yeah, he was first. Hey, sorry. My turn. Uh, can you can you hear me all right? It looks like yes. we can. Um, uh, on that last point, Jonathan, I I hear you. I think for the reminder on chapter one forty nine, you may not be able to, that you may not be able to specify exactly what model or something can be bought, but you can use the specifications for for what I I think for what the performance standard is in terms of energy efficiency and so on, and yeah. I. Having those discussions, probably from having looked at models of different equipment and what's out there that could perform better than and and give us the same results and, you know, from laptops to projectors or whatever um, would be useful to be doing now to be doing now. So we get ready for that. Um, and one of I I gave you guys a lot of thoughts in writing, so I'm not going to go down a long list, but. One of the things coming out of this conversation, listening to all of you today, the one thing I feel like I'm definitely hearing is that our projections of use, hours of use, are probably too low. And, um, you know, I think the townspeople are probably going to take a much less refined look at how we've hit the model or not. And that's, did we produce enough power to cover all the power needs of the building at the end of the year? And did we, or did we have to pay the electric utility money because we underbuilt on the solar and we're, the, and the building is using more power because of occupancy, because of whatever. 
which makes me think we should maybe have a more realistic eye about the level of occupancy we can expect and level of use and then plan for more solar panels to cover that. Um, I know we don't want to, I know we're at a delicate budgeting point and we may not have tons of flexibility there, but um, my guess is that's how a lot of people in town are going to look at it. They're not going to go back and say, hey, you didn't hit the EUI target or whatever. Right. Um, the bylaws basic point, the overarching point is you had enough solar power panels to power your building. And I, I think, you know, so I don't know how we can finesse that, but maybe make sure the margins on the solar panels are not cut lean, but maybe cut even more generously than you're doing now if you have the opportunity at some point so that we can grow. Because I think you're right. People are going to want to be there in this building. And when I looked at the charts of the schedules, the summertime schedules looked pretty condensed. Um, no weekend use and stuff, as I remember them. So anyway, that's my big takeaway from today's conversation. And I really want to just congratulate you all on all the work you're doing. I, I know when I issue a lot of uh, comments and stuff, it may look like I don't appreciate or don't understand how hard it is to do this. I've been there and I, I have some idea and I really appreciate what you all are doing and um, that'll be going forward. And I hope you start to think about bringing kids in and the staff to do some of this plug load analysis, there was a really great chart that I referenced in my second letter that uh, an education on energy group did so that kids and their teachers could go through exist the existing rooms in their school and figure out how much energy was being used by that room. And be thinking about it, like, this is how many hours this printer is on and it uses this many watts. And I think the result of doing that will be both engagement and also maybe discovering some other equipment that we could get into the stream of, of our procurement that will do better for us with less energy. And that's a really important thing going forward. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you, Rudy. Bruce. Well, uh, I echo Firstly, what Rudy said, this is a kind of astonishing. I probably sound like a broken record now after a few years of uh, saying I'm always impressed with uh, everybody here, whether it's the committee, the consultants, uh, Denisco's. Uh, people know how much, uh, how highly I regard you all. And uh, and uh, um, and it's not stopping. Uh, this is a, a very uh, rich conversation. I've got a lot to say. I'm not going to say anywhere near like all of it, of course. Uh, I'll probably put some of it into an email. It won't be like eat Rudy's emails, which I uh, still stand probably like you do in awe, uh, because not only does he write eight pages, he references everything at the, on pages nine and 10, which is beyond belief to me. Anyway, so... Uh, um, a couple of comments that I had. First of all, um, the 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 comment that you made, Jacob, about uh, and and uh, and others as well, Kevin, I think, managing expectations around uh, a, a successful building. And I think I've said this before, probably a long time ago, because I noticed this uh, in the top ten uh, AIA top ten awards that were being. Uh, as they were evolving through the early aughts, that some buildings uh, I was critical of because they were quite, they seemed to have much higher energy use than I thought was reasonable. And then when I started calling the folks who were using and designing those buildings, I found out exactly what you said, uh, uh, Jacob, and and uh, that the uh, the building was so successful that it was failing, and I'm air quoting failure. Uh, and this occurred to me that um, uh, here, if I understand it correctly, it wasn't mentioned in the conversation, but it seems that we really do have to succeed, quote unquote, on the on the um, on the EUI at twenty four point nine in year one in order to uh, gain the Eversource uh, um, payment. If that's if I understand correctly. That is an important uh, 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 goal, and and one that we 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 have one point six million dollars resting uh, or wagered on. 
it seems to me that someone like me um, ought to perhaps consider writing one or two opinion pieces, uh, hoping to cleverly publish them in the local newspaper, where I reflect, we reflect, but since you all are so busy, I got time, I can do this sort of thing, and and help uh, manage expectations around in, in the community around this, and perhaps help understand that in the first year at least, uh, perhaps we might have to be uh, a little more severe in the way in which we uh, uh, try and stick to uh, designed uh, schedules and uh, and uh, and uh, and programmed function. Um, and I think I could probably do a couple of reasonably um, engaging seven hundred word pieces on that. So I might try and do that uh, as we move uh, toward the time when the the rubber hits the road on this. Another thing that I was wondering about was the uh, the maintenance, uh, the policy. What is it? Uh, the management policy uh, document that Shelley and and Jacob are advocating. Um, I wondered who was writing that, who would be producing that, and I think I may have missed something when I was making my notes to self because you may have discussed it in that two or three minutes. But I was thinking that uh, again, I would. Uh, uh, be available to help uh, draft that. So I don't know whether this is something that's going to be uh, run through the town manager or whether this is Rupert's job and he's just going to, uh, or whether it is a uh, uh, another piece of uh, work that is uh, uh, paid for under some fraction of the budget. But however, if it's if it's more the la uh, the former, then I could. Um, uh, um, avail myself because I did spend uh, about nine or ten months ago uh, quite a time writing a, 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 a so far ten page uh, uh, document around the, uh, the, the the this stage of the challenges associated with this stage of the project. So I've been thinking fairly deeply about it. So I would offer my services uh, in, 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 in my assistance is available there if it's necessary or if it's useful. Um, another comment was um, on this checklist itself, Shelley, uh, um, you were trying to say, well, uh, try, thinking about how, how thorough this uh, document should be and how to communicate more. It occurred to me, I don't know whether this is useful or not, but I'll say it and you can decide. I often use color um, as another dimension uh, on a on a document like this to indicate, and it occurred to me that in your comments you could have one or two or three colors that indicated level of concern. Um, you may not want to, you may not feel you need to. I'm not necessarily feeling there's a need to, because it seems that everybody is so uh, intuitively collaborative here that. I think anything that's said is probably going to be dealt with. So that's why I'm not sure that this is all that helpful. But color is a useful uh, presence, particularly if, if um, well, it's a useful, it's another, it's another variable that can be used to communicate in documents like that. Um, I want to applaud the you and the and the checklist of uh, um, uh, raising the the question of consideration of global warming potential and the choice of some of these materials. And also, um, I've said before, and you noted that uh, the trying to slope the classroom ceilings, I couldn't, I couldn't help uh, thinking, ah, yes, I like that idea. Um, uh, I think um, some of the other things I will, uh, um, yes, I think my list is, uh, that's enough for now. I am so impressed with everything that's doing. I really did actually read that checklist and I did read the commissioning reports and I did review the energy model. And I don't, I don't usually do as much as Rudy does when it comes to reading all this stuff, but I think I actually did read it and I didn't write as much as he did. I never will do that, but it's very encouraging. It's very encouraging to see how um, diligently and how confidently this group, and whether it's the committee or the design team or everybody, just seems to be um, 
uh, functioning on this project. It's it's such it's it's beyond a relief now. It's a delight, you know. Initially, I was relieved. I thought this is great. I don't have to claw through these documents the way I thought I was going to have to do, because you all are doing it far more competently than I could ever do. And now it's just uh, it's getting to be inspiring, and I'm really really thrilled to be uh, a part of this, even if it's very unofficial. Thank you so much, all of you. Thanks, Bruce. Um, um, Tim, I just want to clarify one thing that um, Bruce said or asked you. My understanding of the Eversource incentives, and this is a double check, is the big one is at the construction phase after we've built, where they're taking a look at the modeling and saying, <clears throat> given the expected use, we're going to hit the target. <clears throat> Smaller one, the $200,000, it's not nothing, is after year one, did we hit it? Um, is that correct? Uh, there there are several factors. So yes, there's design, then there's construction, and then there's a separate one that is if you hit the EUI target. And that's, I don't know if it's the smallest of them all, but it is not nowhere near 200,000. So if for some reason we did not hit the 225 EUI, the incentive that we lose is, I think it's under $10,000. Yeah, no, that's what I was just saying. There were pieces. So so Bruce was saying it's 1.6 at risk. I don't think the whole thing is. It doesn't mean that we don't want to make sure. We're, we're trying to design to it, but um, I didn't want to raise the alarm that it like, particularly in the town, we're, we're counting on that money. <laughs> no, the, the, the really big chunk, the, the heat pump adder, that is not dependent on hitting the 25 EUI, thankfully. So Maria, you, you've joined the room. I, I did allow you to talk. Thank you. I'll I'll be really brief. 1,000% um, to what Rudy said. He read my mind um, and, and spoke my words. Um, I'd, I'd just like to suggest to Jonathan and um, um, Kathy that it, everybody is agreeing that we have work to do as a town to help define what the use of this building is going to be. And I think that we can be much more accurate and much more helpful to this team if we get together and we talk and we really come up with much more accurate um, estimates of how we think this building is going to be used. It's not going to be a mystery. Um, I mean, there will be some things we don't know, but there's a lot that we can help with. So I hope that we do that uh, in some way as a community to help you um, build this uh, and design this so that we are meeting our goals. And um, and if that means having more PV, then I agree with, with Rudy. We, we shouldn't be stingy there. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And just so all the participants know, I think, you know, this has been recorded and our team our staff team is pretty good at getting us the video. So um, if you want to go back and check what we were talking about, I'll, I always share it with Margaret, if that's useful. We, we get it pretty fast, both for minutes. Because um, I agree. I thought this was an incredibly rich discussion. But I, I just wanted to make sure that everyone knew that there is a recording of this, not just um, uh, uh, there people's notes. <laughs> Kathy, I think Jacob had a, a follow-up comment. Jacob. I just want to make a, a quick clarification go on record um, and attribute credit to Ali for the um, really excellent comment around um, uh, expectation management. Great. Well, I'm going to ask for uh, one more round since we've had a, a round of public comment, one more last round of comment from the 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 rest of the attendees. And if there is none, I will then move us to adjournments. Seeing none, I will I will say we are, are done for today and thank everyone for their participation. It's been a, it was a really good conversation. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank and you. happy Halloween. And happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. <laughs> Thanks everyone. <laughs>